course, everybody knows you, your work. So just I would like to thank you very much for your, for your presentation today, for our cooperation during all those time years and for, uh, for this very, very important project program, Erasmus Plus, which we are developing during the last time with Venice University and Elena is leading this project from um, Italian side, which is very, very useful for our students. Thank you very much, Elena, for everything you did for my students, yeah. for, for us, for archaeology in Georgia. Thank you. Please, you're very much. Yeah. Well, I think that I, what I'm seeing is your uh, your screen uh, and not mine. Uh, probably is it the same for everybody else? Okay, I, I close it. So now try, try yeah. Now. Okay. So now you should see my screen. Let's see. Do you see my screen? No, not no. yet. Mm. Um, now? For one participant, uh, it's open now, shared. Now for you. No? No? Still not. No. Let me see. Did, did you. Um, let me see what. Uh, I think you have to put me as co-organizer or something like that in order to for me to for me to be able to present uh, okay screen is shared for one participant for you already for me. so now i can try again yes please, yes, please. No. Okay, good. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Let me see. So now you see the screen. Yeah, yeah. You see the presentation. Yes. Okay, so I cannot see anything. I can see anything else. So I will, I will start talking and if something goes wrong, you just tell me, okay? Okay, okay. 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 So, first of all, I would like to start by organizing, by uh, thanking the organizers, in particular Vartang, who uh, had a really brilliant idea to use the um, COVID situation in order to, um, to have a, a, an occasion of meeting colleagues in an international environment, which is something that uh, was possible even before, but uh, who knows why nobody thought about this. So my theme was uh, uh, the early Bronze Age in Georgia and international relations. But before discussing it, it is necessary uh, to agree about what is the early Bronze Age and what are its chronological limits. This may seem trivial, but in fact, there are different definitions of early Bronze Age, which are used by different schools of archaeologists, and they are a constant source of misunderstanding. So the, the system, I will say something that uh, you all uh, know very well, but maybe for students it's good to repeat. The system goes back to the system of the three ages, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, which was developed in the first half of the 19th century by the Danish prehistoric scholar Thompson. Um, this was based on technological evolutions, so the introduction of metals in in, in especially, which were supposed to have happened in successive moments and therefore to have a chronological significance. Now, this chronotechnological definition was later, later on further elaborated by the archaeologists dealing with different cultural areas, such as European prehistory, Near Eastern archaeology, Caucasian archaeology, and so on. But and each of these schools created their regional periodizations based on it. So the chronological 
use of technical innovations has, however, a main problem. That is that these technical innovations did not take place at the same time in the different regions. And therefore, the synchronization of the different areas is difficult and becomes a source of misunderstanding. A good example of this problem uh, is the different use of early Bronze Age by Near Eastern archaeologists and specialists of Caucasian archaeology. So in Mesopotamia, uh, metal is not very widespread in the earliest period. And pottery and other aspects of material culture or social organization, so, uh, such as the degree of social hierarchization the urbanization and so on, uh, or for the later period, the sequence of dynasties were considered more effective chronological indicators. So although the name of the period remained the same, the early Bronze Age for Near Eastern archaeologists is now understood as the period of the city-states and the first empires, between the end of the Uruk period, the first urbanization, and the end of the Ur tree empire. More in general, it is considered to be roughly equivalent to 3rd millennium BC, although the introduction of C14 dates now suggests that the absolute dates are slightly different, let's say from 3100 or even 3200 to probably 2000 or 119. Uh, one, uh, one, um, under, uh, 1900 BC. So the technological meaning of the term um, introduction of bronze has thus been largely lost. In the Caucasus, however, the local school of Soviet and post-Soviet archaeologists continue to use the term early Bronze Age in its original meaning, and therefore define the beginning of the period as the moment when the technology of bronze was first introduced. To make things even more complicated, some researchers include the alloy of copper and arsenic in the definition of bronze, while some consider only the alloy of copper and tin. So this leads, of course, to very different chronological limits than those used in Near Eastern archaeology. Uh, excuse me, Elena, excuse me, please. The screen is stopped. Yes. So are you changing now the picture? No. Uh, no? Well, okay. Uh, okay. I don't know. I have a picture, the picture of a uh, introduction uh, with introduction of bronze. We are on the first page now. Oh, yeah. So okay. this leads uh, to very different chronological limits than those used in Near Eastern archaeology. So fourth and mid for, uh, third millennium BC. Now I changed. Is it okay? Do you see? No. No. The, the, the same picture. Same. Oh. Which picture do you see? First one. Oh, I know, I'm picture, I am in, on picture five. No, no, this is just a title only. But mm, this is very strange. Does it work better no, like okay. this? Now, yes, now, now it's okay. Now, now do you see? Yes, yes, yes. Second, third, fourth. Is it okay? It's okay, yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. So this is uh, what uh, uh, what uh, the situation in the Caucasus. So when we try, uh, so in in other words, uh, this is the situation that for the beginning of the early Bronze Age in uh, among Near Eastern archaeolo archaeologists is the end of the Uruk period in. The uh, among Caucasian and uh, uh, European prehistory specialists, it is the introduction of bronze. Um, so when we now try to compare the periodization used in the Northern Caucasus, in the Southern Caucasus, and in Mesopotamia, we have a sort of curious. Let's try like this. Is it better? Can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. I changed. Yeah. So. There is a, a sort of curious fault line 
so that the same terms are sometimes used by different schools of archaeologists with a different definition and intending different chronological periods. So I could continue on this and add many details to these problematic issues which have not been solved yet. But this is not the aim of this lesson. I just wanted to make students aware of this difficulty and clarify that I generally consider the early Bronze Age as corresponding to both the Kuraratsas culture and the following early Kurgan cultures, Matkopi and Bedeni, and therefore to a range of time between the mid fourth and the late third millennium BC, about 2100. Uh, this, in my opinion, better fits the situation in the Southern Caucasus and the need to compare it with the ancient Near East. However, in this lesson, I will mainly concentrate on the Kura Raxis period. And I will deal with it in the framework of the contemporary Near Eastern cultures, uh, and uh, so in, a gener in general terms, but drawing from the experience of the work done in Georgia between 2009 and 2017 by the Georgian Italian Shidakarti Archaeological Project of the Foscari University of Venice in collaboration with the Georgian National Museum at the sites of mainly of Kashuri Nazargora and Aradetis Orgora Guglaudi. So you probably already know the Kularaxis culture very well, but what I would like to do is to reflect on why is this culture and this period are so important for Georgia in the Southern Caucasus and is the center of so much study and discussion. And my answers are several. So first of all, it is so important because it marks the expansion of a culture of South Caucasian origins, the Kuralaxis culture, over vast areas of the Near East, including Eastern Anatolia, Northwestern Syria, and down to Palestine and Northwestern Iran. A phenomenon which will not be replicated for millennia. Even the kingdom of Uralpu in the first millennium, which more or less has covers the same area and is a very successful uh, um, political entity, uh, covers in fact a smaller territory. So now other remarkable features of this culture are its persistence for about 1,000 years, so from 3,500 to 2,500 BC, and its conservatism. So there is, or there are of course elements of development which can be seen, for instance, in pottery morphology and decoration. Um, this is uh, a, a, um, a scheme, what may be uh, considered the, uh, an internal periodization of the Curaraccio's culture, um, which is the traditional distinction into three successive stages, Curaraccio's one, two, and three, which I still think is the most appropriate uh, division, at least for Georgia. Although I must say that recently a division into only two uh, stages, which originally was proposed by scholars working in Armenia, has been uh, uh, favored by numerous scholars. So there is an internal development, but there is, and there is also a considerable degree of regional variation in pottery, as well in, as, uh, in other elements of the material culture. And this is the reason of the, um, of the different names by which the culture has been known in different areas. And also of the alternative name of early Transcaucasian ware, which, was, uh, um, which is now scarcely used, but had been developed in order to include all the regional variants. Um, so I remind you um, that the term Curaraxis, which is now universally used, goes back to Boris Kuftin, the great pioneer of archaeology in Georgia, to whom I would like to pay tribute, 
And another tribute I would like to pay to Antonia Sagona, which was the great pioneer of curar access studies in the Western uh, uh, Academy. So to go back to our team, and without entering in further details, in spite of all this regional and chronological variability, the curar access culture is characterized by a package of immediately recognizable elements which occur throughout the, its distribution area. And they show remarkable conservatism. So we have carinated vessels with lugs in dark, often red and black color, a profusion of fixed and mobile fireplaces and environs, often with anthropomorphic zoomorphic decoration a whole range of metal objects, weapons and uh, ornaments, and objects uh, connected with uh, metallurgy, so crucibles, uh, uh, mouths, and so on. So a similar apparent contradiction between overall similarity and persistence and local and sometimes even individual variability can be observed in, further, in other fields, such as architecture, where we have mostly villages of simple and often rather um, ephemeral monocellular or bicellular um, buildings. They are built in different techniques, so uh, mud bricks, uh, wattle and daub stones, but the plants are more or less similar. And they have, uh, but they can have a rounded or rectangular plan as well. The same variability and uh, homogeneity can be seen in funerary customs, where, for instance, grave shapes are multifold. We have pit graves, cyst graves, stone lined pit graves, kurgans, and so on. But and, uh, the types of inhumation can be individual or collective. Uh, but on the other hand, funerary goods are modest and rather stereotyped, and they occur throughout the, the area. These are some examples from the Glauri Center. So another distinctive feature of the curar access groups, if compared with previous and surrounding cultures, is their apparently rather simple lifestyle and egalitarian social organization. There is a lack of evident signs of status, for instance, in burial goods, of a clear settlement hierarchy. There are some few larger settlements, but uh, in general, they are all rather small and simple. Um, a lack of architectural specialization. Um, so there are no monumental public buildings or even uh, specialized industrial installations. So all this suggests that curar access community were an egalitarian society where the individual household was the center of most economic, uh, social, and cultic activities. And hierarchy and central control were quite weak, if present at all. So why was this culture so successful and spread over a wide area and lasted so long in spite of this conservative and very simple organization? So I think the answer is to be looked for in the general framework of the late fourth and early third millennium BC developments in the Near East and in the Northern Caucasus. So it is well known, even now in popular literature, that the fourth millennium BC is marked by very good transformations in Mesopotamia. This is the time of the so-called urban revolution, according to Gordon Child's definition, with Uruk in southern Mesopotamia, exemplifying the first city and the first state organization um, with all what it means, so monumental architecture, um, figurative arts, uh, administration, including the invention of writing. And with the Uruk culture spreading, in the second half of the millennium uh, to northern Mesopotamia, 
by the so-called Uruk expansion or Uruk colonization, as, for instance, uh, um, exemplified by the Uruk colonies like Abu Bakabira on the um, Syrian Euphrates, on the Syrian Euphrates. So influences from the southern Uruk culture even reached beyond the Taurus range. Um, for instance, at the site of Azantep and Malatia, where in period 6A we, found, we find a monumental palatial building, temples, uh, figurative arts, mural paintings, and uh, a complex administration. So less familiar to the wider audience, but well known among Near Eastern archaeologists uh, um, for at least uh, the last 40 years now, is the fact that the process of urbanization was well on its way already in the first half of the fourth millennium BC, and even more important, that it fully involved northern Mesopotamia with centers like Nineveh, El Brak, which of which you see a few uh, a few pictures here, El Amukar, and Aslantepe. Here at El Brak, we have monumental architecture, uh, public buildings, temples, exotic goods, administration. Uh, the same at Aslantepe in, in period seven. 3500 BC, we have temples, monumental architecture, uh, stamp seals, mass produced bowls, all signs of uh, incipient urbanization. Uh, so, but a more recent discovery is that deep connections existed in this period, so in the first half of the, uh, third, of the fourth millennium BC between Upper Mesopotamia and the Southern Caucasus, as proved by the distribution of the mm, tradition of vegetal temperate pottery, the so-called chaff-faced ware, which starts, in fact, already in the la late 5th millennium BC. Here you can see the, the assemblages of the Brat in northern eastern, eastern Syria and Leila Tebo Yutikazik in uh, Azerbaijan are the, uh, almost identical, both in wear and in the shapes. So this is also not very new. It has been known for about 20 years ago. But more recently, uh, also, Scholat fully realized that equally revolutionary changes happened during the fourth millennium BC, even further north in the Northern Caucasus, where um, the, C14 the new C14 calibrated dates for the microculture helped the fixing it in the full, fully in the fourth millennium BC, let's say in the middle, mid fourth millennium BC and continuing in the late fourth millennium BC. So compared with the Uruk culture, the microculture shows different but equally important uh, elements of complexity and social inequality. We have monumental funerary barrels, you know, you all know very well the famous uh, Royal Kurgan of Mycop, which, uh, so monumental kurgans which contain uh, accumulations uh, accumulation of valuable objects of precious metals and exotic goods like lapis lazuli. Mm -hmm. So in particular, a level of unprecedented uh, technical proficiency is reached uh, in the field of metallurgy. So it is clear that the whole area between southern Mesopotamia and the south uh, the, um, and the northern Caucasus, but as well for that matters, even further away, because in the same period we have similar development, for instance, in Egypt. So all over this area, new forms of social organization and leadership, control of labor, goods and products, were quickly developing. Only the, let's say, the marks, the, the, the way in this, this, this uh, re revolution manifested is, are different in the north and in the south and in the different regions. Uh, and 
this so in South Mesopotamia we have a monumental public architecture. In the island regions we have royal graves, wealth accumulation. In um, South Mesopotamia we have central administration. In the north, in the north we have a development of metallurgy. So there is an extraordinary flourishing of creativity, innovations technology and arts, and international connections, um, lo long distance uh, exchanges. So this is the international situation around 3,500 3, when the Kural Axis first appears in the Southern Caucasus. The cradle of the culture uh, lies just midway between the southern Uruk, which is expanding towards uh, uh, northern Mesopotamia, and the northern microculture. And it lies within the vast area occupied by chaff faced ware and different local traditions. So, in spite of this uh, uh, proximity to these uh, cultures, uh, uh, microbes, which, uh, which were very innovative, uh, the, the Kura Raksas culture appears uh, completely alien to the profound innovations that we have just seen. And even most surprising, at first sight at least, uh, it doesn't seem to take part uh, into the widespread circulation of exotic goods, uh, such as uh, like this lazuli well, and so on. I can follow you. Sorry? Elena. Yeah? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. I, I can. What is, the, what is the problem? Uh, maybe Vartan lost the connection. Let's wait. Should we wait? Seconds. Yeah. A few seconds. Uh, the the problem is that I cannot see you. I see only my presentation. <laughs> no, you can okay. Yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, it's okay now. So I can start again. Yes, we can continue, please. Yes. Yeah. So I said that, that uh, the the Kural access culture doesn't seem to take part uh, in this uh, um, in this uh, uh, network of innovations, and even uh, it doesn't uh, seem to take part. Uh, into the widespread circulation of exotic goods, such as uh, like this lazuli and so on, and uh, iconography, many of which uh, are connected uh, to the exhibition of the new power, uh, and we, which are, so the, the circulation of uh, goods and iconographies, uh, one of the characteristic features of the surrounding cultures. So this was the situation around 3,500 BC, and this is the situation a few centuries after this, around 3,200, 3,100 BC. So the Kural Axis culture is now firmly attested in the Southern Caucasus and confronts the Northern expansion of the Southern Uruk culture, in a sort of cultural border, which um, is simplified by the site of Aslan Tepe, which lies exactly on the border. And in fact, in period, in period 6a, we have uh, the influences on Aslan Tepe, mainly from the southern Uruk culture, but some connections with the uh, Kuralaskas culture. But now this is the situation around around 2800-2700 BC. So after the collapse, which is still to be completely explained, of the Kuruk culture in northern Mesopotamia, and uh, and when uh, connections between north and south are cut. Um, the Kural Axis culture has expanded over a wide arch all around the North Mesopotamian plain until reaching, as we say, the Palestine and uh, Iran. At Aslan Tepe, for instance, the Mesopotamian influenced palace 
of period 6A is substituted by the Kural Access Village, Kural Access like village, let's say, of period 6B in a complex development which was probably not totally peaceful, but uh, no, also uh, without, uh, um, without a proper war situation, a complex development which I just mentioned here without uh, entering in details. So it is difficult to escape the conclusion that the expansion of the Kural Access culture is directly connected with the vacuum caused by the crisis of the first urbanization. And in some way, that it represents a sort of reaction to the Southern model of socio-political organization and more in general, to the first, the fourth millennium trend toward social hierarchization and inequality. So we can now try to develop this line of thought by examining some of the characteristic features of the Kural Access culture in comparison with the Uruk or the Michael one. We can, for instance, examine pottery. So in, we have uh, quite a number now of, stu of archaeometric studies concerning the based composition and technological studies uh, for the definition of manufacturing technique, uh, firing and so, uh, surface treatment and so on. So the uh, Kural Access culture has local raw materials and uh, a not very differentiated uh, fabric. So all the vessels are made more or less of the same fabric uh, with mineral temples and uh, with often the, the um, addition of grog, so ground pottery. On the other hand, the Uruk pottery has diversified fabrics um, in the different vessel types. Uh, Kural access pottery is always handmade, whereas uh, Uruk pottery is at least partially wheel-made. Uh, and in some cases, beveled rim balls, they are even made with a totally different technique in mounts. Uh, Kural access ca culture pottery is produced in individual households, whereas in, for the Uruk, we have uh, industrial production. Uh, also in the appearance we have of the pottery, we have uh, uh, differences. Kural access, uh, Kural access pottery has careful surface treatment, varnishing, which makes vessels uh, slightly shiny, and sometimes uh, the vessels are decorated. The Uru pottery doesn't have any of them. Uh, Kural access pottery has, is fired in alter, by alternating, oxidizing and reducing atmosphere. Uh, probably this idea came from familiarity with uh, metallurgy uh, techniques. Uh, whereas Uru pottery is always fired in oxidizing atmosphere. The visual um, appearance is also very different. The Kural access vessels are dark, Uruk vessels are light, uh, light in color. Uh, especially uh, Kural access vessels play with uh, bichromy between uh, red and uh, red and black, as we all uh, as we all know. Uh, so there is a weak Kural access vessels as a weak functional specialization. So the, the vessels are mostly uh, biconical in shape and uh, a few basic types, jars, uh, white butter pots, jugs, uh, cups, and so on. Whereas Uruk pottery has a strong functional specialization, so every vessel seems to be to have a, a special shape for a special use. And then Kural uh, Access. Kural Access vessels have some very distinctive elements like carinations, lugs, the presence of lids, which are only partially functional. Um, and uh, Uruk pottery has function-related elements such as 
spouts and so on, or even lugs, but only on certain vessels. So that is, this is the situation. So we have a contrast under every point of view. We can say, say the same about cult, for instance. We have uh, in Kural Access, in the Kural Access culture, we have domestic cults where um, have ceremonies seem, most ceremonies seem to take place into the individual houses or in very small shrines. Where, and the center of, of the cult seems to be the entire place. We have no special plans for temples, just some uh, small shrines which are similar to normal houses in plan. We have some isolated monuments like this um, obelisk uh, which was found in Armenia, but not, not many. In Uruk and the Uruk cultural sites, we have uh, temples, monumental architecture, and even uh, um, tem temple quarters. Uh, then we have probably in Kural Access no full time specialists, so priests, and we have dedicated personnel in Uruk. We have, as for the gods which were adored, of course we cannot be sh uh, sure, but the only thing that we can say for the Kural Access is that we have some vaguely anthropomorphic entities for, like. Um, the ones which are uh, represented on some vessels with eyes and nose, and the same features are emphasized in uh, fireplaces and, and irons. On, in, uh, on the contrary, in Uruk, we have fully anthropomorphic gods, or at least some uh, pantheon of full anthropomorphic gods, which seems to be developing. Then, uh, ceremonies, we cannot say much about uh, ceremonies taking place in the Kural Access um, environment. We, can, we will see one example uh, just in a minute, but probably they were small scale. Whereas in Uruk, we have, of course, public processions as the one uh, represented on the Uruk vase, and uh, probably large public ceremonies with large scale food distribution through mass produced vessels. So one idea what may be uh, a, a, which kind of ceremonies may have played in the plural access um, communities um, can be imagined on the basis of a recent discovery by our project at Aradetis Orgora. So this building, of which unfortunately only a small part could be excavated, is only slightly uh, larger, but on the whole, uh, similar to the surrounding houses of the Kural Access village, and contains a fireplace. It was in this area. This is the, the section of the wall of the, the wall of the shrine of the shrine. So inside it. Uh, we found, uh, we made this uh, um, peculiar uh, discovery. So we found the remains of two zoomorphic vessels. This is at the moment of the discovery, and this is one fragment. They were painted as well. And this is the these are the vessels after the restoration by the um, restorers of the Georgia National Museum. They were... Uh, probably in the shape of uh, water birds. So pollen analysis by Elisa Pavadze of the Georgian National Museum showed that the vessels contained pollen of vitis vinifera, so wine, modern wine, and other plants such as hazelnuts, uh, interesting weeds, which usually grow beside vineyards. And in addition, there were also these uh, little hair, uh, remains of hairs of the drosophila, which is a, a tiny fly, the fruit fly, which typically fly around grapes and wine during the first stages of the fermentation. And the, these uh, flies 
swarm in large numbers during fermentation, and mm, as a result, they easily fall into the large vessels where wine is placed. So this composition, that is vinifera and other connected plants and uh, the rosophila hair, is exactly the same, which is found in modern vessels where home-produced wine in Georgia is stored. So we came to the conclusion that the two vessels were used for ritual libations or toasts. Uh, ritual because of the strange shape, let's say, of the vessels. <laughs> which we have imagined in this way in a didactical comics that we prepared for both Georgian and Italian secondary school children with the help of the Italian embassy in Tbilisi. So this wine was taken in the vessel and then libated or drunk. So in this way we can we can state that the, the, the Kuraraxa sculpture can be see, set at the beginning of the long Georgian tradition of, of the ritual use of wine, which continues until now, which uh, these are some examples uh, in the different historical periods, but it, the tradition continues until now in the, uh, in the um, tradition of Supra. So um, uh, this was for cultic uh, activities. If we now go back to the comparison with the Uruk period and we proceed to analyze funerary customs, uh, we can say that unfortunately no direct comparison can be done with the Uruk culture. Because the funerary customs of the, of the um, Uruk culture are unfortunately still a big question mark, so they are rather poorly known. But we can compare the Kurarazza's culture with those um, uh, customs, with those of the North Caucasian Maikop culture, or of the culture, contemporary cultures of the Southern Caucasus, such as the Leila Tepe culture for the fourth millennium BC. So these are uh, the, for the first half, let's say, of the first of the fourth millennium of the fourth millennium BC. Or we can compare the Kuraraxes customs with those of the later early Kurgan cultures uh, of the mid late third millennium. You all know the Kurgans of the uh, Bedeni and the Bedeni Kurgans, and uh, here is, uh, as an example, uh, the recent discovery uh, of the Ananauri tree uh, Kurgan by the Georgian National Museum. So, all these examples, the fourth and the mid late uh, third millennium BC, are characterized by the northern tradition of barrow graves which are quite unusual in the, the most ancient Near Eastern civilizations. So, so the, uh, uh, we don't have this kind of monumental graves in Mesopotamia. So I will not enter the complex question of the origin and development of the Kurgans. But what is important is that all these examples of Kurgans are... <laughs> Is there any problem? No, no, we are listening. Oh, it's okay. So, so they are all elite graves which contain rare and valuable objects and exotic goods. So Kurgans are not alien to the Kuralaxis tradition. In fact, in some areas of the culture's distribution, for instance, in Azerbaijan, they are relatively common. Here are some examples, Mentesh Tepe and Uzun Rama. Uh, but as we have seen, um, but, but this is not the case in Georgia. So in Georgia, they are rather rare in the Kural Axis period. However, uh, what is important is that, as we have seen before, uh, Kuraraxis funerary monuments are much more diversified, sorry. Much more diversified. 
And what is important here to notice is that Kurarax's school guns, like in these two on the bottom, uh, bottom right of the screen, are collective graves, which contain uh, the remains of a large number of individuals. So they are not elite graves of one main, uh, um, main uh, inhumated. And also they don't exhibit any clear feature of elitarian graves, as for instance, the, the burial goods, like in this case, are rather modest. So as I said, burial goods are rather modest, and they are similar to those of the remaining Kuraraxis graves. And they don't contain any exotic material and other precious objects which may have played the role of status symbol. So typically, the Kuraraxis burial goods consist of a few vessels, uh, and they are joined by a few metal or stone ornaments. But these are not offers or status symbols, uh, but they seem to be personal ornaments worn by the deceased. This is, for instance, an example of how they were found in one of the graves of the Doglauri Cemetery, dug by, uh, in a salvage excavation by Yulon Dagoshiz and its team, and uh, presently we are working on the common uh, presentation. Uh, so this is a grave where it is clear that the pin was uh, uh, on the shoulder, so it kept uh, some sort of, uh, of, um, of tissue. The arm, the, um, the bracelet was worn on the wrist, and the beads were on, around the neck. Um, so, in many, in many other cases, uh, the fine spot of the objects in the graves suggests this. Of course, objects also, objects in metal, copper alloys, mostly arsenical uh, bronze, uh, cannot be considered as proper status symbols as they are relatively common in Kuraratis graves. And they are, so to say, local products in an area where metallurgy was rather widespread. So it is, on the contrary, rather significant that gold, which was known and extracted by the Kuraraxis people as the, shay, the case of the Sarkrisi uh, mine shows, um, with uh, um, evidence of uh, use in the Kuraraxis period, uh, gold does not feature prominently in Kuraraxis graves. In fact, it is uh, practically absent in all of them. So the Kuraraxis metal ob ornaments belong to a few distinctive types. The double volute uh, head pins, spiral bracelets, drop-shaped pendants, other types of pendants, uh, earrings, diadems are maybe a bit uh, peculiar, let's say, but all these objects tend to occur throughout the, pop, the culture's distribution area. So they rather, rather than status markers, maybe diadems are an exception, but all the other uh, are, rather uh, than, uh, um, let's say, uh, status symbols, they seem to represent powerful markers of cultural identity, similar in this to pottery, to decorated fireplaces and the dirons, which we have examined before. So in other terms, they are, so to say, parts of, sort, of a sort of Kurarax fashion, let's say, which we try, have tried to recreate for didactical purposes. And please don't take these pictures too seriously. These are, in the, on the left, um, school children recreating uh, Kurarax's uh, jewels. Uh, pins and diadems within uh, um, uh, Kafoskari open day, and on the right, uh, a member of our team who um, wore original pieces from the glory. So don't take the picture.
just too seriously. But um, let's say the idea is that rural access people have a distinctive way of dressing and uh, adorning themselves. And so a similar reasoning could be done for other features of the rural access culture. For instance, uh, shapes, uh, pottery shapes, the, the presence of uh, lids, uh, fireplaces, uh, and the use of special sorts of cereals have been uh, pointed out by some scholars recently that they, these, all these things may mark a specific rural uh, access food habits, so some sort of rural access cuisine. So to conclude, it is difficult to escape the impression that the secret for the success and longevity of the Kura Raxas culture lies in this strong cultural identity, where status and social hierarchy, if existing at all, there were probably some local leaders, uh, tribal leaders in the Kura Raxas groups, but they, um, but uh, the hierarchy was purposely de-emphasized to the advantage of identity markers, which create strong horizontal ties within each group, and also between different groups which belong to the same culture, which in this way probably made alliances, alliances in between them. So part of this cultural identity is also the refusal of imported materials, objects, and iconographies, in spite of the fact that Kural Access groups were not isolated. They were, in fact, in contact with the surrounding populations during their spreading um, their, uh, over the different areas of the Near East. And they were certainly part, uh, they had a precise role uh, in, in the interregional network for the exchange of goods, especially probably they were exchanging metal ores and metals with other, uh, with other uh, uh, groups, probably also other products uh, like uh, wine and uh, uh, some people have also, have also suggested salt and so on. So as we have seen, it is also difficult to escape the impression that many elements of the Kura Raxis identity were modeled in contrast with those of the Uruk and of the microbe cultures, but especially they were modeled in contrast to the model of hierarchical urban society that the Uruk culture conveyed. So this model, the urban society model, originated in Mesopotamia in the 4th millennium BC and later on will expand well beyond its core area and became, uh, let's say, typical of the Near Eastern uh, Bronze Age societies and later on spread everywhere in the world uh, as uh, nowadays, let's say, most all the societies are, in fact, urban societies. So it was a very successful model over the long, uh, long, long durée. Uh, however, this model, in the beginning at least, with limited technical um, equipment, let's say, was especially suitable to the large Mesopotamian alluvium, alluvium where the presence of vast plains uh, favored the uh, practice of uh, 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 cereal agriculture and the agglomeration of uh, large quantities of people in uh, urban centers. And this was the model was therefore a bit difficult to export in the difficult and diversified environment of the highlands. So those mountain and uh, um, plateaus landscapes which extend to the north of Mesopotamia and on which the southern Caucasus, together with Anatolia and uh, Iran, is part. So in this sense, 
the egalitarian and autarchic model represented by the popular access culture was much more suitable and adaptable to the highland environment. And this is probably another reason of its enduring success. So it is not a chance that the expansion of the popular access culture completely skips the Mesopotamian alluvium, alluvium and nearly coincides with the arch uh, of uh, um, highlands uh, continuing here, uh, not towards Western Anatolia, but towards the hill of Syro Palestine, uh, which surrounds the uh, Mesopotamian alluvium. So, uh, however, so this is probably the reason of its success. Uh, however, in the course of time, the urban model turned out to be more successful. And in fact, the renewed expansion of the mid third millennium uh, uh, Mesopotamian second urbanization will, in fact, mark the end uh, and the disappearance of the Kurar access phenomenon. So, this is. Uh, um, I mean, this is uh, um, something which is open for discussion, and I hope to hear the, uh, your comments about this. And in the meanwhile, I thank you very much for your uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. It was so I close now this, and uh, I try to yes. No, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you presentation yes very useful and it's so complicated subject and your your speech was uh, very easy to follow because uh, very good organization of the presentation uh, that up. thank okay. you so much I, I i think there are some questions so any questions please walter maybe you will open yes with pleasure so um it's a period which I did not know such precisely, but uh, I'm really fascinated. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I have a, a lot of questions. Uh, how how do you explain this this um, conservatism or this um, parallel worlds between Kuwar access and and the Uruk world system? Do you think it's only the way of life, it's the, the climate, it's the landscape, it's or is also the religion and the traditions. Let's say in a, in a way versus Mormons, mm. versus uh, how you can, it is fascinating. Well, I don't know, I mean, exactly what, what uh, uh, seems uh, um, to me to be the case is that the uh, Urban, uh, urban model, let's say, had a great appeal. So um, it, uh, uh, during the fourth millennium BC, it really spread uh, everywhere. And uh, uh, it's not only cities, uh, but uh, for instance, administration, which is, uh, uh, which is found in uh, the Aslan Tepe, for instance. Uh, and uh, so it expands to the north. At the same time, there are iconographies which spread very widely, and they are all connected to power. So to the, uh, there is a need to express this new leadership. And there are uh, iconographies such as the priest king, so-called priest king, which reach Egypt. Uh, the, the lion, the, the, the bull. So they, uh, they, they are found in southern Mesopotamia in the microculture in Egypt. So, so I suppose, of course, they are quite straightforward symbols of power. But I suppose it cannot be a chance that everybody started using them in the same moment. So they were in touch with each other, these, all these... Uh, um, uh, cultures, and in fact, we know that we, they were because they all uh, uh, imported the lapis lazuli, for instance, in this moment. So, the, uh, probably 
I, I think that this created some sort of reaction uh, somehow. So there were some groups which, uh, um, which uh, didn't uh, uh, so easily accept this model. And maybe when the Uruk culture uh, somehow collapsed, we don't know for which uh, reasons, but in the north, uh, obviously it was less, uh, um, less suitable to the, to the environment. So it was difficult to maintain cities and central control in areas which were, didn't have so high um, agricultural um, uh, agricultural uh, yields uh, um, where contacts were not easy were so uh, there was uh, some sort of uh, reaction and probably this reaction found these groups uh, which were fragmented found uh, um, a common way into this uh, strong identity provided by rural access. So this is uh, what I think. What I think is uh, some possible is a po possible explanation. Can I a second question uh, to continue this this uh, argument? Uh, I know that for access is seen as a as a sedimentary sedentary civilization oh. living in the. But do you think it's Nevertheless, possible that there were much more also some kind of transhumans. The question is, it's it's uh, it's silly maybe to to think the the Sumerian conflict between the the farmers and the transhumans is maybe um, some some glimpse from this uh, Uruk and 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 cooler access. Yeah, in a way, yes. I mean, uh, in uh, in Georgia, for instance, in the Kura Valley, I think the Kura Rats were sedentary. Uh, the, the, the people living in the in the valley of the river, but they had a mobile component. There were people living on the mountains, and probably there were also migrations. I mean, I'm not. Uh, uh, totally against the hypothesis of migration. The, the people, some people were moving to Anatolia and then probably some others from Anatolia even to Palestine. So in Palestine, they were probably immigrants. Uh, and So probably they were exploiting the vacuum uh, provi uh, provided by the collapse of the uh, cities. So there was, when there was no strong uh, control on them, uh, they, uh, in, in this um, um, but, um, uh, frontier environment, they probably managed to, uh, to infiltrate. Was it peaceful or was it not so peaceful? We don't know, but there are some episodes of destruction. Yeah, but the last question, then I will finish. Yeah. Yes, but please. not so much the uh, um, collapse of the urban, but because of the urbanization in the in the Mesopotamian plain, that more land became free for these new groups. Yeah. Like yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. also, it's. It, I mean, the question is very complex. Uh, yeah. The, um, uh, excavators of Aslan Tepe have uh, worked a lot on this question. Probably the, 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 the central administrations in areas like uh, Aslan Tepe, they tried uh, to put under their control uh, the, uh, the transhuman groups. And then when they, uh, when, uh, they somehow reacted, and uh, and uh, and then they manage to take uh, to take over. Thank okay, you. Great. Okay. Any questions? So I think th this was a very uh, uh, clear picture when you were showing the high landscape, which totally corresponds with art, corresponds to the area of, of, of coral culture. So th this was very good. Uh, final point, let's say, of your presentation. Any questions, please? I've got a question. 
Yes. 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 Hello, thanks for your presentation. You were talking about the egalitarian society or egalitarian life uh, in the context of Kura culture. I would like to ask you how you could describe or how you could suggest the social landscape and distinction between the working groups who we are involved in technological innovations. Yeah. How you could, if you could uh, give us some more precise hypothesis or ideas about it. Well, it's not, not easy I mean, uh, to, to answer precisely, but let's say we, we don't see any of the usual marks of uh, yeah. um, hierarchy. So normally yes. in Mesopotamia, a hierarchy is marked by, I don't know, some houses are larger, richer, and so on than the others. And this is not the case yes. here. Some, uh, there are um, temples and uh, specialized, uh, big specialized areas for workshops. Here we don't have it. Uh, we, we have a small, very small shrines. And uh, we have activities area, activity areas for metallurgy, for instance, uh, but uh, they are inside the houses. Of course, a big question mark is the question of gold, because in um, as for gold, there seems to have been a different organization in the, these miners. Um, Village in um, near near the Sacrisi mine, but this is still uh, still an open question. For uh, for uh, bronze met metallurgy, for instance, it seems that there are really very simple installations which can be uh, um, which uh, every household could could uh, could have it or objects. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah. But of course, this doesn't yes. mean that there were uh, no leaders because there are other societies which, uh, uh, which uh, mm, give the idea of being very egalitarian and based on tribe mm -hmm. links. For instance, the Bedouins. But uh, the Bedouins, in fact, had very powerful leaders. Just they played, I mean, they, they, they emphasized the, the fact that they were similar to their people. So they didn't, yes. uh, yeah. so that, that is the, the yes. difference, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? A clear any team? Uh, May I okay. have some question? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, hello, all. And um, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, uh, I have um, a few questions. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we have seen on the map the distribution of Kuraraxian culture in uh, the mid centuries of uh, third millennium BC. Um, and uh, especially uh, there is an uh, interesting uh, area, um, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, the oh. Sea, Palestine and uh, Syria. Uh, do, do you have any uh, explanation why uh, the Kuraraxian culture uh, spread in this area oh. and uh, also uh, they uh, took the sea coast also, yeah. and um, uh, if uh, there is uh, some um, using of, uh, uh, um, let's say, say, say sailing or uh, traveling by sea in the Kurara in culture. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly. I know that it has been suggested. Um, about traveling by sea. It has been suggested by somebody that they traveled from uh, directly from, uh, let's say, the um, 
the co uh, northern part of the coast of Syria to uh, Palestine, but I cannot say. Uh, what I can say is that uh, probably they were following some uh, old routes, uh, which uh, already connected in the fourth uh, millennium, the area of the um, upper Euphrates, so Malatya, with uh, uh, Syria and with Syro-Palestine. So there are in the fourth millennium common uh, elements in the material culture of uh, Aslantepe and uh, for instance the Amuk area and so on. So I, um, in these areas, I think uh, uh, the rural access people were immigrants. So th there was uh, some sort of migration. And I think they came uh, probably from the upper Euphrates. So they didn't come directly from uh, Georgia to um, Palestine. They, uh, they came from uh, uh, the upper Euphrates where previously they had... Uh, arrived, and probably they followed the traditional routes of exchange. What they looked for, or what they brought there, uh, probably different things. Maybe they found it easy to, to reach these areas. They didn't find any contrast. Uh, what they were bringing, probably one possibility is metallurgy. Uh, another possibility is uh, wine. We say that, that wine is a typical product of the Southern Caucasus since the sixth millennium. Uh, and uh, so there are other possibilities. There are many, many possibilities. So they interacted with the local population and probably they found a way to, to live together with mutual advantages. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, do we have uh, some uh, clues uh, if they have some uh, interaction with uh, Egypt uh, in this period? Do we have some uh, artifacts, for example, as far as I know, no. I mean, they didn't reach Egypt. And uh, of course, they, as I say, that they seem to have refused uh, to, uh, they didn't like exotic goods. So even if they knew them, they didn't, uh, they didn't use them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I would like to continue first. First, Sabah's first question. Um, he was talking about the Mediterranean coastal line, which was occupied by Croatia, but nothing, nothing like this was happening along the uh, Black Sea coastal line. This common explanation: this the natural conditions are different. This is, it does not work because it's not correct. This is only the south of the wetland. North from the wetland and south from the wetland, the condition, natural condition is the same as in the inner part of Colfield. So how we have to explain absence of Kurwara culture along the coastal line of the sea? What do you think? I don't know. Just uh, what I what I know is that uh, Western Georgia and the Black Sea area are always very different in their development from uh, the rest of uh, Georgia uh, and the Near East, let's say. Yeah. So maybe the, the environment is also different because it is... The uh, central part is different, only, yeah. only small part. Other areas are the, are the same as the Mediterranean coastal line. Mm. So, yes, it is. Yeah, but maybe to reach this area, they had to cross areas which were not uh, so good for, uh, for them. Because they, they certainly avoided all uh, low-lying plains. They already crossed this uh, mountainous area because in such area we have uh, Kurgan and, uh, let's say, and Asian. Okay, this is... This is yeah, but... 
another story. I don't know. I I really don't know. <laughs> another story. Okay, my okay, it my dear. So, uh, any questions? Any questions? Perfectly on the team. <laughs> okay. So in this case, Elena, again, thank you so much. This was absolutely, absolutely different and that's very useful presentation. Very useful, not, or, not only for my students, but just for all of us. So thank you very much. I hope to see you very soon in Georgia and to work with you again. To continue to work with you. Well, it was, a, it was a pleasure for me and I really hope will be i will try to be present at all the next appointments of this um, of this series because they were they are really interesting okay. thank you very much thank you okay. thank you Walter. everybody anita thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you Thank you. Oh. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye, bye, -bye. to everybody. Bye.